<laughs> Welcome to Indiana University Robert H. McKinney's Office of Diversity and Inclusion's Creating Affirmative Spaces, Fall 2021 um, edition on ableism, complexity of our words and actions, personal and systemic impact. Approximately 26% of the U.S. population has some form of disability, apparent and or non-apparent. While disability is an identifier like race or gender, many non-disabled persons may transition to the disabled community at some point in their lifetime, and it can happen in a second. So this percentage is likely higher due to underreporting and people not feeling safe to report. Members of our disabled communities experience assaults, poverty, and, un and underemployment at higher rates than non-disabled pe people. These are a couple of the many reasons this topic is so important. In order for us to be a better neighbor, friend, colleague, caregiver, and advocate, we need to take diversity and inclusion and all of its aspects into account, which includes disabilities and ableism. IU McKinney has been in an over a long year process of diversity strategic planning and addressing ableism is also incorporated. For those of you who are doing similar work, if disabilities and ableism are not part of your conversation, I strongly encourage you to include it because there's a lot of work to do. In addition to accessibility of spaces and processes, we must remember that words and actions are powerful. They have the ability to empower and uplift, hurt or oppress. And society continues to evolve, so should our vocabulary and our vernacular. The disability metaphors found throughout our everyday conversation and messaging continue to perpetuate negative and disempowering views of disabled people and have connotations that disabilities are negative or a bad thing or tragic, which is hardly the case. As with many marginalized or minoritized groups, many disabled communities make their own accommodations as they navigate through a world and society that was not built with them in mind or kind to the differences outside of the norm. We have a lot of work to do to create truly welcoming inclusive spaces for people to be fully valued with respect and dignity. I do this work and I'm always struck by how much ableist language is in our, my vernacular. So I hope you'll join me on this journey. I am joined today um, by a panel of experts and advocates, not only for themselves, but for others. I have had the honor to listen to them speak in other venues and I'm confident you will learn a lot today and leave with some new insights and action items. I will now turn the webinar over and each panelist will introduce themselves, but I will start with Jeff Russell, Director of Operations, Bureau of Rehabilitative Services, who is serving as both panelist and moderator. Great, thank you, Patricia. And we'll go ahead and go through the rest of the panel here and let everybody introduce themselves and then we, we will just dive right in here. So uh, Angelica, I'll let you go first here. Hi, my name is Angelica Guevara. Um, I am a proud neurodivergent Latina. Uh, what that means is that I have a reading and a writing disability that requires all of my books and my email for me to be put in electronic form so that I can hear them. And I require also an academic coach that is a human being that helps me translate um, my written word into organized thought instead of in scattered, staying in scattered form for the able body. Great, thank you. Um, AJ. Hey all, uh, my name is AJ Link. I use he, him pronouns. I have on a black lightning hat and a white shirt and there's a gallery wall behind me that my partner uh, did for our place. Um, I'm based in DC, which is um, stolen land from the Anacostia and Piscataway people. I'm here representing the National Disabled Law Students Association, uh, which I'm the president of and helped co-found. Great, thank you, AJ. And uh, Carlos. Good afternoon. My name is Carlos Taylor. I'm with the Gregory S. Ferrybach Center uh, in Indianapolis, where we provide internship opportunities for college students with physical disabilities. Uh, I am blind. I'm completely blind. I've been blind since I was about seven years old. Uh, I'm an alum of Ball State University, where I received my bachelor's in business information technology and my master's degree in what's called information and communication sciences. Great, thank you everybody for, for joining the panel here for being part of this discussion. I'm just kind of piggyback on what Patricia was saying. You're talking about 26% of the US population has some kind of disability. I mean, that's more, when you look worldwide, it's more than a billion people worldwide that have some kind of disability. So it's just a great time for us to come together and, and have this discussion overall. 
Um, I want to open up with some terms. I know, AJ, you were going to discuss just some terms that you thought it was good for everybody to know here um, as we dive into the discussion. So I'll hand off to you, let you talk about some of these terms, and then we can dive into some of the, the other topics here. Yeah, I think understanding that disability is not just um, a medical marker or an impairment, but disability is an identity um, for a lot of people. Um, recognizing that when we say disability, it's not just talking about folks' physical impairments, but kind of the way they experience life. Um, the panel talks about ableism. Ableism is kind of the institutional and structural barriers to access that disabled people face um, when trying to navigate the world. Uh, I think it's really important that we understand that part of ableism is disabilophobia, um, which I, I, I'm sure we'll talk on, which is kind of the fear of disabled folks and, and you know, the fear of disability, whether that's in, in caricatures or in media portraying disability as something that's horrible and awful or ugly. Um, and, and I think we'll, we'll also talk about, I know Angie um, wants to talk about kind of ableist language that we use in everyday life, right? Um, I know that Patricia talked about that in the intro, but things like calling people stupid or dumb or, or crazy, hysterical, insane, kind of all these, these words um, like handicapped, crippled. Um, there are so many different words that we use in our everyday language. I'm sure we'll talk about this later, um, but being able to understand that you know, we, we've all used those terms, right? Um, even I have used those terms, but it's kind of un, unlearning kind of the ableist structures that we've grown, grown up in uh, is really important. I hope that conversation, uh, uh, the conversation today uh, kind of shows that. And, and piggybacking off of what AJ just, said, AJ just said, if you're unsure of how a person would like to be referred to, definitely yes, people first language, but there are some people that prefer um, identity first. For instance, in my case, I say I am neurodivergent. Um, I don't say I am a person with a disability, just as an example. Great, sorry, yeah, thank you. Um, so, so Angelica, let's just go right in there uh, for you then on that topic. Let's, I mean, have you discussed that piece? So um, I always like to counter the narrative um, with personal lived experience in that um, I had to fight throughout my education to try to get accommodations because since my uh, disability is non-apparent, I am often not believed. And so I had to um, wait in law school two weeks for my books to be cut and scanned back in the days when we were still in um, the era where you couldn't get the books automatically, electronically. Um, and when I was in the PhD, I had to wait five weeks for my books to be cut and scanned. And so that actually is what pushed me to learn more about the law and start feel, start to deal with the shame that comes with that stigma that it was internalized um, ableism. And so that's when I started to use the term, I am neurodivergent because I was just so sick and tired of feeling like um, I'm, I'm not being believed. So the only way that I knew how to fight back um, within my own self uh, first was to embrace all of it as an identity. So I started, I started there. Great, thank you. You know, in, in my experience, I, I, I definitely would like to hear from the other panelists too. It, it seems like there's really two school of thoughts when you're talking about um, people who have a disability just as a whole. And really you've got the one that it's disabled people are just, you know, basically unfortunate victims of circumstances. Yeah, they need to be loved and cared for and shielded from any harm or experiences. And then there's the other that um, the disabled people are just naturally inferior or disagreeable or, you know, sometimes, um, beneficiaries of unfair or unjustified generosity or, you know, social protections, those kind of things. And, you know, I'd love to hear you guys' take on, on those two school of thoughts, because it seems like, you know, for me, working with vocational rehabilitation and, and the individuals that we work with, dis, uh, with, with disabilities, they come in with one of those two types of beliefs, even about themselves. You know, so I'd love to hear your guys' experience um, as far as how you've dealt with that or what you've seen, or if you kind of feel like there are those two school of thoughts. And, you know, even from there, you know, how can we, you know, kind of work around that and, and correct some of those beliefs that people have? Great. So I, I agree, Jeff. So, yeah, there are systems in place in this country, you know, so that, you know, people with disabilities can have, you know, some type of, you know, income or care if needed. And some people might think, well, you have all these governmental systems in place. What what's the deal here? But you know, for for me who you know I'm blind, but I still have the same desires and goals that anybody else does who's not blind. So 
you know, I have a desire to work and earn a, a an income and, and, you know, have a house, uh, which I do and, and, you know, pay all the bills and all these things. So you're, you're not going to be able to do a lot of those things um, with the limitations, um, you know, living on government programs. And just not only that, but just, you know, if I want to take a vacation, just like anybody else, I'd like to go and take a, you know, go on a vacation. So the, the goals and dreams that I have are no different than those without disabilities. And I have a desire, um, you know, to, to uh, educate myself and, and, and pursue additional education, um, you know, job advancements and all these other things that, you know, people, you know, without disabilities desire as well. Yeah, this is AJ speaking. I think it's important to realize that kind of the, the dichotomy that you were talking about, Jeff, is rooted in like the charity model of disability, right? The handout, um, woe is the person with a disability or the medical model with a disability, right? Where the disability has to be fixed or cured. Um, but there are, there are other ways of looking at it, right? Uh, the social model of disability gets um, a lot of publicity kind of within disability advocacy circles, but you know, there's the affirmation model of disability, there's the relational model of disability, right? Like, I guess, um, if you really dig deep into, you know, disability theory and, you know, disability rights, there's so many different ways to approach it, right? There's um, the no, the relational model or the Norwegian model of disability, right? With disability is your relation to the rest of the world. Um, there, there are just, there's so many different ways to approach disability. I think disability is really complex. We talked about the number earlier, um, 26%, but like there are some estimates that say it's, you know, as high as 40% if you count people with temporary disabilities or who have experienced disability in some way or will experience disability in some way. And so we have to, as a society, realize that it's complex, right? Not everyone who's blind views themselves as, as a disabled person, right? Not everyone who's neurodivergent views themselves as a disabled person, right? Um, not all deaf folks view themselves as having a disability, right? Some people um, do not identify capital D as disabled, right? Like um, we have to understand that the, the identity of being disabled is extremely complex and we have to allow the room for that. One thing I just wanted to mention real quick is, um, and in my observations, um, some people just are so uncomfortable with the word disability. I mean, some people are just so uncomfortable with it, they, they'd rather not even say it. You know, I've had, had people say, you know, are you sight impaired? You no, know, well, I mean, I guess, but I'm blind. You know, you can say the word blind, that's fine. It's not offensive, but also, you know, I guess over time I've, I've learned to embrace the word blind you know it's not a shameful thing and you know no i don't have the ability to see with my eyes like somebody who sighted might be able to but that doesn't mean that i can't you know use my computer to do to do my school work my my, my full-time job work or, or whatever the case may be or all these other things that i do in my daily life i may have to find another way to do them but it doesn't mean that i can't do it and sometimes uh the the, the attitudes that people have pose barriers or present barriers to people, whether they're blind or have any other type of disability, but the attitudes that people may have, like, well, you you are this, so, you know, you're X and Y, so you can't do A and B, those assumptions, you know, oftentimes throw up walls and, and challenges to, to uh, people who otherwise are capable of doing something, they may just have to do it a different way. Mm -hmm. This is Angelica. Um, going off of that, often is upsetting when the limiting belief systems of another individual placed upon people with disabilities um, tries to impose this idea of, well, why don't you just go ahead and try to do something different that maybe your disability allows for? And for example, in my case, since my disability is heavy reading and writing, um, it, re it relies on having to um, figure out other ways um, to operate an academia of all things that is heavy reading and writing. They often would say, don't even bother doing higher education. Why don't you go do something else where your disability doesn't interfere? So often having to counter that message and saying, no, I am entitled um, to the same dreams, dreams as everybody else. Why am I being limited? in what I would be able to achieve um, or aspire to just because you have this limiting notion of my disability. This is AJ, yeah, I think Angie and Carlos, your point about people being afraid to say disability, I think that goes back to kind of the disabilophobia, not having the language. Like you, you hear a lot of euphemisms, right? Like, um, you, you know, differently abled is one that, you know, I just, I, I just really, really dislike. Um, Me too. 
<laughs> you know, and it, it's like, it's almost like disability is a dirty word or a taboo word, right? And I think that comes from, you know, the fear of disability and not being, you know, comfortable wading into the language. Oftentimes, like when you see um, um, non-marginalized folks trying to get into conversations with marginalized folks, they don't have the, the vocabulary and they're uncomfortable using the preferred language of the community. And I think that's something that we really have to work on. And, and this is Jeff. And just, you know, going back to thinking about um, not being afraid to realize that you're wrong and, and what you're saying or how you're saying it and, you know, being open to, you know, have that feedback from, from the, the other individual or for the person with the disability to kind of understand how to better communicate with them. As we work with employers a lot in our field, that is always the issues. They're always afraid to have that discussion, or always afraid to you know, go down that road because they're afraid they're going to say something wrong. And most of the times, you know, an individual with a disability, we will help to correct things. We will help to make sure that you understand what we need and how we feel and what we need to hear just to help. We're, most of the time, we're not going to be upset by that. Uh, the fact that you've made a mistake, we're going to try and help you. And just on the, the receiving end, making sure that you're willing to you know, receive that information back is always very important. This is Angelica. Um, and when, 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 when sometimes I know I've made it a couple of times, I made mistakes or I've said something that was wrong. Um, it's about trying to do better next time and being open um, to the feedback. Um, I have served uh, with AJ in, in other panels and I've always learned so much from AJ anytime he speaks. Um, and sometimes I, I don't know all of the different things that are out there in the you know, cosmos of the disability complexities, but knowing when, um, when to listen um, and hear other people's experiences and wanting to do better to become an ally um, in uh, the disability justice movement um, is something to consider in that we're not perfect. We are, we are people, we're human. That's such an important point I wanted to um, piggyback on is in listening to an, indiv an individual with a disability. That means engaging with that person. There's been times when, for example, I've gone to a restaurant um, with a friend or, or a fiance and we're sitting there ready to place an order and the waiter or waitress comes and says, would he like, you know, more water or what would he like to drink? So they're, they're I mean, I, mean I, I know they're uncomfortable, but they're really going to the extreme and not even engaging with me, but I'm the one who makes my decisions. So, you know, uh, I, I still pipe up and say, you know, I'd like X, Y, or Z, um, even though they didn't direct the question to me, it's about me and I'm sitting right there. So don't be afraid to engage with the person with a disability, whether it's a person who's blind, maybe it's a person who uses a wheelchair, even people who have speech disabilities where maybe it's difficult to understand them, but still, you know, don't, don't ignore the person uh, and speak to somebody they might be with. Always engage with that person and, and try to learn from that person directly. This is AJ. Uh, Carlos, it's such a good point. It goes back to kind of dehumanizing people based on their disability, right? And I think it's, you know, part of it's media perception, part of it is, you know, how society treats people. But a lot of people have this view of, of disability and disabled folks as, you know, not being able to be an adult, not being able to be a full-fledged human being, which is, you know, absolutely wild because, you know, <laughs> disability is, is, again, like the largest marginalized group in the world. Um, they're all over the place, right? Um, and I think, you know, showing humanity goes both ways, right? Angie talked about being willing to learn, but um, a lot of advocates, you know, and this is just general advocacy for marginalized folks, don't give a lot of grace um, which is something that I've been like really big on. And we have to show our vulnerabilities and our, on our mistakes, right? Like I am a disability advocate who has used ableist language, right? Like I am an autistic person who before I, I learned more about my community uh, was okay with the work that Autism Speak does, right? Um, what, you know, and Autism Speaks is not a great organization for autistic people, right? But I had to learn and I had to grow. I think um, the more that vocal or, or uh, visible or, you know, um, whatever popular advocates, you know, whatever word you want to use, admit that they too make mistakes and, and have had to learn and grow into their, their positions. Uh, I think you'll get a lot more people who are willing to, to take the plunge and, and learn and talk about things that they don't know, right? A lot of people are, are scared of, you know, saying the wrong thing or doing the wrong thing, but we've all done that, right? And I think 
um, more people should be willing to admit that they're not perfect, right? I still learn every single day from other disabled folks about things that, you know, I've said or done that are maybe not the best thing for my community. And, you know, as someone who speaks for the community, that's my response, my responsibility to, you know, take that criticism seriously and, and be better. This, this is Angelica. Um, I'm, I'm gonna I'm go off on that grace component that AJ talked about. Um, I used to, I, this is back in the day, I used to get really angry and upset. Let's say I would be on a date and the person was ignorant about disabilities. And as soon as I disclosed on a date, my disability, um, I had an incident where the person essentially um, started to have this fear around disability, thinking that if this worked out as a relationship, that meant that their kid would become disabled. And basic and putting in um, the intersectionality of what um, some of us go through on this idea of being, first of all, as a woman reduced to production, um, that's a different story. But this feeling of I would be angry because automatically this person probably has never had to um, talk about disability and their assumptions is auto automatically that's less than a disability is less than a disability is saying that you're not a whole person and the fear I don't want my children to come out disabled. And so I used to get upset now I'm starting to see what well, the benefits of having grace when I see other people having grace with me. Um, when I, um, I'm imperfect and I don't know everything that's out there. So I think that is a way also to create allies um, is to definitely encourage other people to educate themselves um, because sometimes it becomes just very taxing for those that have disabilities to constantly be educating people. They should be doing the work themselves. <laughs> um, um, but also showing grace um, when the person is open um, to learning and listening. And I think I think those are great points. And that's kind of what I was hitting at there at the beginning is just understanding that it's it's okay. It's okay to make mistakes. It's okay to, to, to say the wrong thing, but just being willing to make that change on your end when you realize it. I mean, when you realize that you've you said something wrong, take the time to correct it. You know, and we've all used different terms. You know, one that for the longest time I always used was falling on deaf ears because that's what you've heard, that's what you've known. Um, luckily, I, when I started working for Voc Rehab, I've got you know, about 47% of my staff have a disability, at least that I know of. Um, so out of 300 people, I've got you know 120 people that have a disability, and a lot of those uh, were in the deaf community. And so they were able to just you know sit down, because I actually said it in a meeting, and they were like, hey, listen, that's just probably not something you should say. I understand what you're trying to get across, but that's probably not the best way to do it. And that's okay. I don't mind you telling me that. I, I want to make that correction. So I think differently about how I do it in the future. Cause now I always think walking into any of these meetings with, with staff or anybody, you know, you know, any kind of group, what, what am I going to say that could offend somebody? And if so, how can I correct that and make sure that I try to avoid it in the future, just so I don't, you know, hurt anybody's feelings or upset anybody you know, by doing it. Yeah. I so think thinking about, go ahead. Sorry, Jeff, I was just gonna say, yeah, I, th I think this is AJ speaking. I think, again, that goes back to kind of how we're, we're taught, right? Like one of the things that really bothers me as a disability advocate when someone says wheelchair bound or confined to a wheelchair, right? Instead of a person who uses a wheelchair or a wheelchair user or what have you, right? Like people people view disability as like this, this punishment almost. Um, and I, I'm sure we'll talk about it a little bit later, but the flip side of that is like the overcoming narrative. Like, I can't believe that you can, you know, put your clothes on when you're disabled, right? I can't believe you can wake up and be a human being when you're disabled. And I'm sure we'll talk about that later. But um, yeah, just again, I, I think Carlos and Angie both put it really well is, you know, just focusing on the humanity of the person is, is, is so key. Yeah, I, I always... Um... It, it always is uh, interesting to me that term wheelchair bound, like you said, it's like this connotation that the person's bound to their chair and they're like they're, they're restrained. But in actuality, the wheelchair is liberating. I mean, a person can get around and go places, you know, permitting that they're wheelchair accessible that they otherwise may not be able to go to or, 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 or what have you. So the, the wheelchair is actually liberating, not not keeping them back. So I always find that term really interesting. 
and, and keeping on that language, this is Angelica, um, and keeping on that language before I, um, I owned my disability. Um, and I would often use the term, oh, I'm paralyzed with work. Um, this idea that you're stuck um, or you're overwhelmed or that, that is implying that somebody who is paralyzed is stuck when that's not the case. Society is the one that's disabling. Um, there's nothing wrong with us. Um, or the term, um, the term um, uh, visible and invisible disabilities. And Margaret Price talks about this in her book on, um, then that implies, why not use the word apparent and non-apparent disability? Because that implies that somebody that is, um, somebody that's blind can't see when they can't see, they just see differently. Um, so those little terms that um, became big in my world, um, as I started to learn uh, what is oppressive language and what perpetuates that oppression um, when you use those terms. Yeah, Jeff, I know who you want to move on. This is AJ, but I just want to say also language is so important, but I also believe that we shouldn't, we shouldn't get super hung up on language. We should educate folks. We should stop folks when they use ableist language, but we shouldn't necessarily deem that person as not wanting to help or not having or coming from a good place just because they don't have the language or the vocabulary because maybe they haven't been taught and haven't been exposed. So I think language is important. Language is powerful. But again, you know, giving grace to folks who maybe don't have that vocabulary just yet. Amen. Right. It, it's, it is, it is a fine balance. And, and, you know, for anybody who I engage with, I always tell them, you know, language is, is you know, yes, I understand you want to be politically correct and what have you, but you know, when somebody comes up to me and says, if they know that I'm a Colts fan, you know, did you see, I mean, uh, I mean, did you hear the game yesterday? I mean, they don't have to change their terminology in that way. You know, I've, I've known people who use wheelchairs that say, I walked here. Well, they didn't physically walk, but they didn't take any other form of transportation. So in that sense, you know, around me, I'm, I'm blind. People don't have to be careful about using the word see or look or or what have you. Um, but this is, I guess this is mainly thinking of how you perceive a person. Do you perceive the person as a person who happens to have a disability or do you perceive the person as disabled first and their humanity to secondary? Yeah, great. That, that's a great point. Uh, just to kind of end that there with Carlos. I mean, it's really how do you see the person and start to think through that part. Um, I know we've talked about some of the language pieces of it, um, but what are some other ways that um, we might see ableism out there, um, either in the work environment or just out in general, um, that you, or at least that you guys have had experiences with? This is AJ, I'll try not to rant too often, uh, but simply put, ableism is everywhere, right? Even when you think about um, here in the US abiding by the ADA, a lot of that is, is the bare minimum, right? It's not true access, it's uh, uh, avoiding legal liability, right? Ableism is, is and how high your tables are at your restaurant or when you're with friends and picking an establishment to go to for drinks or happy hour or whatever. Um, are you acknowledging that some of your friends probably can't drink because they're on medications um, or, or, you know, they have uh, substance abuse issues, uh, which can be deemed as a disability, depending on, you know, how you interpret the law? Um, it, it does it take stairs. Uh, Carlos was talking about how wheelchairs can be liberating, but only if they have access. Does your friend that uses a wheelchair have to go to the back of the restaurant to get in? Um, like it's in schools when you think about virtual attendance and you think about the, the fight now to, to get back into the office, not realizing that a lot of immunocompromised folks still aren't safe going back into the office, not creating flexible work environments for people um, who, who maybe have doctor's appointments or things like that. When you think about our medical system in general and, and how um, disabled people, Carlos kind of talked about that, um, are oftentimes una unable to work because if they make too much money, then they don't get their disability benefits um, and then they can't afford to go to the specialists and all that. I mean, like, it's like the entire system, the entire world is built around excluding disabled folks. And we're only just now starting to, ha to have real true conversations about what access means. And um, this is Angelica. And, um, you know, just because something is like, like AJ said, um, the ADA is the bare minimum, just because something is ADA compliant, there are incidences where in certain um, restaurants, 
it's it, the, the restroom is ADA compliant, but the way that they um, designed being ADA compliant, it may be only accessible to somebody with a certain type of wheelchair, but not another type of wheelchair because the way that they did it was um, they assumed it would be just easy to just transfer or um, or assuming that they would have a wheelchair that is of a certain um, width, not length, or a certain length, not width. So those types of things that people don't stop to think about um, in terms of accessibility. I work a lot with technology. In my prior role before becoming the program manager of the Ferry Box Center, uh, I worked at Ball State University where I provided assistive technology um, access and uh, alternative media, essentially working with students and faculty with disabilities and technology solutions. Um, and one of the things that oftentimes people don't think about are just some of those technological barriers. Um, you know, if you're working for a company or a firm that's acquiring a piece of new technology, you know, ask that, you know, vendor about accessibility. Has this been designed with people with disabilities in mind? Because oftentimes when you go through the, you know, the purchasing process to acquire, you know, new technology, you find out that it's not accessible later on and you can't really retrofit it later. Um, so whether you're designing something, you're working with a design team or you're, and you're um, searching for a you know, piece of technology um, through a, a third party vendor, always think about accessibility when you're making those purchases and, and those implementations. Um, so since uh, you know, there's wonderful technology, um, Angelica mentioned some of the things that she uses. I use what's called screen reading technology, something similar. And as wonderful as these technologies are, sometimes there are some barriers when it comes to accessing certain types of information. Uh, for me, one of the biggest ones um, in recent years has been what's called a CAPTCHA. So it's those little security systems that when you go to create an account on a website, it asks you to you know, type something that you see in the picture. Well, somebody can't see the picture, then that's a roadblock. Um, here in recent years, there's been some efforts to find alternative ways to get around those, such as audio systems and what have you. But sometimes if somebody has a hearing impairment, then those can be really difficult to understand. They're hard to understand if you don't have a hearing impairment, even more so if you do. But so I'm just mentioning that as an example of some of the technological barriers that can exist. Um, as wonderful as technology is, uh, there, there's still some work to be done. With the technology that I use, um, I use a Bookshare and Learning Ally, um, and you have to have a certified uh, disability in order to qualify to be able to use those resources. Um, and so some employers don't want to acknowledge, and it's unfortunate that I keep on encountering this time and time again, they don't want to acknowledge that I have a disability. In fact, they've actually openly in written form expressed um, how they don't they don't, um, they can't certify that or can't acknowledge that this is a disability because again, my disability is non-apparent. Um, and so I'm sitting there and I'm like, wait a minute, but in order for me to qualify for these resources and this technology, I had to submit all of the doctor's paperwork that to show that I have a disability, but in your eyes, um, I don't have one. So it's constantly fighting even systems um, that don't even want to learn um, about the disability because they actually don't want to provide accommodations for anybody else that has a disability. So having also to fight those systematic issues when trying to access the technology. Yeah, and that's a great point, uh, Angelica. I mean, when you think about like on the employment side of things, and I'll talk a little bit on the employment side here for a minute with you guys. You know, the accommodations and things that, you know, employers should be doing, those reasonable accommodations, um, and just sometimes that difficulty in proving that, you know, you have the disability. I mean, you know you do. You're talking about it. You've got all this documentation, but we've got to get employers at some point to understand that and realize that, you know, a reasonable accommodation in most situations is not going to be that difficult. I mean, you're probably, and I think the average is less than $250 for an accommodation to be put in place. And, you know, that's not that hard. It's not unreasonable to ask an employer to do that. You know, so I, I would love to hear from, you know, either AJ or Carlos too, if you guys have had any of those experiences where you've had difficulties with the employers um, or any, then Carlos, I know you had some um, statistics you, you were going to you know, be able to cover just talking about, uh, you know, the employment or employability of individuals with disabilities. And so I'll open that up to you guys to see your thoughts. 
This is AJ. You can go ahead, Carlos. <laughs> I was going to let you go, AJ. But yeah, so um, employment uh, in general. So the unemployment rate for individuals with disabilities is almost twice uh, of those without disabilities uh, here in the United States. And there's a, a lot of reasons for that. But, um, you know, the other thing, too, is, is, is the, the, the rate of underemployment. You know, people with disabilities are often underemployed. They're, they're earning far less than, than their cited peers or, or their non-disabled peers, excuse me. Um, and, and some of those are some of those systems AJ had mentioned a little bit ago about, you know, maybe somebody has benefits um, and there's these thresholds that you can't cross as far as income levels before your, you know, assistance gets cut off. And some people would depend on these uh, programs to help them get up every day and get dressed and, you know, what have you. Um, so there's a, those are some definite barriers. Uh, but also, even when it comes to employment, I think COVID has um, allowed people to pause and kind of rethink some of the things that their systems that are in place, you know, so is it possible for somebody to work from home, you know, do they have to be present in the office or is that just because traditionally that's just the way it's been for some people with disabilities transportation is a huge barrier. Um, if somebody doesn't live close to work or, or not, on, not on an accessible transportation, uh, not with a live in an area with accessible transportation, that can definitely be a barrier. But can they work from home? Um, now with Zoom and all these other virtual meeting platforms, um, it allows people to participate even if they're not in the, in physically in the same location. Um, so there's, there's so much we could spend, uh, you know, more than an hour alone just talking about employment. Uh, concerning individuals with disabilities. But when you think about making your, your environment inclusive, don't think about just your physical space and think about your technological uh, programs, your technology, your systems that you use, are those accessible for somebody? If somebody were to work either in the office or remotely, are those systems accessible for somebody who has a disability? So I just wanna keep uh, um, throw that out there as well. Yeah, this is AJ. I also think you know, it's it's so frustrating because on the one hand, you know, disabled people are underemployed or, or unemployed at higher levels, but at the same time, there are probably, you know, millions of disabled folks who are employed who don't express their disability for fear of stigma, right, or for fear of outing, right, but, you know, with the ADA, you have to admit and you have to openly identify as disabled in order to get your accommodations, right, and a lot of people are fearful that if they ask for accommodations, um, they, they may be treated poorly in their job, and, and it's kind of this place where you're stuck, where, you know, being disabled is important for you to get the the accommodations and the accessibility needs that you that you require to thrive in your workplace and in life in general but at the same time once you openly identify as that society um, wants to treat you a certain type of way and, and you know I feel like for a lot of people I mean, like the, the, there's no right answer right that's why disclosure and, and self-identification is such a personal choice right I could say that for me as an autistic person it's easy for me disclose to disclose right people may treat me differently, but th th they don't look down on me, right? It's not apparent. If I don't say I'm autistic, oftentimes, unless you spend lots of time with me in certain situations, you may not know. Uh, but for other people, there, there's there's not that that option, right? Um, Carlos, I'm, I'm sure you don't really have the same kind of option when you go into a space, right? Um, whether or not you you want to disclose how, how people interact with you. Um, and, and I, you know, I think that's a, a bit of a privilege that some of us have, but it's also a really difficult decision. You know, yeah, if I'm in a physical space, if somebody sees me, they realize that I'm blind. But, you know, if I'm if I'm filling out a job application, you know, I may not want to put that I'm blind. Yes, there are rules, you know, with Title I of the ADA about providing accommodations, you know, uh, during the interview and in the hiring process and in the, in the workplace. But, you know, there's no way I can prove that because I put that I'm blind on my job application that somebody got nervous and, and didn't call me in for an interview. Um, so, you know, like AJ said, like you said, that, that's such a personal decision. Some people may feel that, okay, I'll put my disability on my job application. If they don't want to talk to me, they don't want to hire me, then I don't want to work for a company like that. I completely get that. But at the same time, I also feel that, you know, that gives somebody an excuse to look over your qualifications 
and set your application aside because they're nervous about the disability. So it is such an individual, uh, individualized uh, approach um, that everyone with a disability has to think about and, and, and be concerned about. Um, this is Angelica. People with disabilities are making 63 cents on the dollar. Um, and I know in my experience, every single time that I've disclosed, um, they've, they've gone around the law by not saying that the reason why they're letting you go is because of the disability, because in their mind, they have this, um, this idea of you and that stigma of maybe if I would have hired somebody different, could they have done the job faster? You know, so in my instance, I was making, um, I was working at REI and um, night stocking shoes because they wouldn't provide me the accommodations I needed to be able to be, um, let's say a TA at Berkeley. Um, so then I had to, out encountering gender issues um, in sexual harassment, I had to then um, basically leave that job and then do night classes so that I could get certified as a behavioral therapist for autistic children while finishing the PhD. And then in that instance, um, as soon as I disclose, thinking I'm gonna save space because they, they have disabilities, so that's okay, I could definitely talk about it. It's a safe space. And as soon as I disclose, I'm out of a job. So that idea of um, when do you feel safe to disclose and knowing that there's consequences um, and what am I willing to stand up for within my own self, right? So with a law degree and a PhD, you know, to be making, you know, a, a wage where it's barely, barely livable is just an attest, an, a testament of what is it that people of, of, with disabilities encounter in the job market when they disclose. Yeah, this is AJ. And I think another layer that we haven't necessarily talked about explicitly is how people may think you're faking when you talk about being disabled, right? Um, I, I've experienced it with people saying you're not really autistic or you're not that autistic or, you know, are you a supercomputer or something like that? Like there, there, there's so many layers of complication where, you know, when you talk about getting your accommodations, once you say you're disabled, they, they, they put the onus on you to prove how disabled you are almost. Like you have to justify um, being disabled or, or, or requesting an accommodation. And that's also a difficult, difficult and arduous process, right? Um, and you talked about having to get all the paperwork, all the documentation, right? That can be really, really expensive for disabled folks who, you know, we've talked about are underemployed, unemployed, or, you know, capped at the, the, the amount of money that they're able to make. And yet in order to, to get things that they need in order to, you know, make money and survive, they have to, you know, prove how disabled they are, which is, you know, a, another way of denying their humanity almost. Not almost, I think that is denying their humanity. Yeah, and this is Jeff. That's a great point, AJ. I mean, people don't think about what it costs to just go into you know, getting just your medical records and pulling those together and you, know, you got to pay for some of these things. And there's just all these hidden costs that this person that is just starting a job in some cases is trying to you know, get things established so they can have an accommodation put in place. And, it, you know, you're right. It does really put the burden on them to, to prove, you know, how disabled they are, or what they can or can't do. And, you know, thinking about those pieces, and I know this is, this is kind of a loaded question and it's not an easy one. Um, you know, how do we start to turn the tide a little bit and, and, you know, start to correct some of these things that we see or you know, what could we start to do as individuals or as groups or, you know, as organizations to start to you know, help everybody see things a little bit differently? One thing, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of talk right now about diversity, equity, and inclusion. And a lot of times I think people just focus on racial and ethnic minorities. And, but I think it's important to also include disability in that conversation. You know, if your organization is, is really truly trying to, um, you know, become more diverse and, and think about all these inclusive efforts, think about people with disabilities as well. Um, not only those uh, people with, with apparent disabilities, but perhaps those with non-apparent disabilities. Um, so I think that's an important um, piece to, to add to the discussion of D, uh, DE&I. And, and this is Angelica, and I would say also countering the narrative. Um, so one of the things that I, I do, at least in my classroom, is um, have a universal design concept. Um, so I record all of my, um, my, my lectures uh, so that we take care of this concept of 
absenteeism for those that can't attend um, because maybe they have or don't have a disability or maybe they've never disclosed or um, maybe it's just wanting to try to maximize human potential, right? So um, getting the concept of universal design as something that is um, a part of our everyday lives um, I, I would push for that as long as also as countering the narrative um, by showing stories of not limited because we have a disability. Yeah, this is AJ. And I think uh, the concept of intersectionality is really important when it comes to true accessibility, because you can be multiply marginalized. Um, we know that uh, people of color, specifically black people, have less economic resources and less access to medical care so they can get diagnosed as having a disability so that they can have these protections. So someone may be undiagnosed with a specific disability and they may not know or they may know or have uh, an idea that they have a disability, but they can't afford all the testing, right? They can't afford to go to the doctors and spend thousands and thousands of dollars for them to confirm something that they already know. So when we talk about universal design and accessibility, it's designing our workspaces, our classroom spaces to be accessible for everyone, no matter what they're going through, right? So when Angie talks about, you know, um, preventing this quote unquote absenteeism, that's more than just folks with disabilities who maybe aren't feeling well or have a rough day or a flare up, right? Sometimes people just wake up and they're having a rough day. You know, like we should, we should acknowledge that that may not count as a disability, you know, officially under the ADA, but sometimes people wake up and it's hard to just get up and go, right? It's hard to go to school. It's hard to travel to work, right? And maybe we should have flexible attendance. You know, Carlos talked about, you know, all the, all the tech that we have to allow from work from home or school from home, right? Like not viewing it as a, a moral failing that someone may or may not want to interact with people on that day, right? I have days where I do not want to interact with anyone, whether it's virtually in person, like I want to be at home, I want to read my book, I want to just sit with my dogs, I want to play my PlayStation, whatever, right? I have those days and I'm sure other people have those days too, where they just don't feel like going out, you know? And that's, that's not a bad thing, that's just human experience. And we should be providing um, a world where that's okay to experience that and people don't devalue your humanity because of it, because you, you're not productive from eight to five on the most random Wednesday in the year, right? That doesn't mean that you're not a good employee or you're not a valuable employee. That just means you had an off day, right? And, and we should design a world where that's okay and it's not a moral failing or a personal flaw. One last thing I, oh, go ahead. Oh, I, I was just gonna say real quickly, the other thing too, I mean, this, this may seem obvious, but not necessarily so. When you're trying to make a space inclusive for individuals with disabilities, include people with disabilities when you're trying to make these decisions, like what works, what doesn't work. And even if it's, um, you know, you're, you're working with a, a colleague or a, 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 a um, somebody you know with a disability, don't be afraid to ask that person, what is working for you? What doesn't work? What can be improved to make things more accessible to you? So make sure you include the person with a disability in those conversations and in those decisions. This Angelica, and going off of what AJ was uh, saying earlier, this idea of a moral failing um, or uh, this idea of what's production um, with absenteeism. In my case, my disability uh, requires for me to not have stimuli for a full day where I have to lay in bed and reduce the stimuli. So I don't have seven days like everybody else. I only have six days to work with. So understanding that just people work and operate differently and it's okay. It's not something to be ashamed of, um, but it's also accommodating to the different ways that people perform is absolutely okay. Yeah, this is AJ. And to Carlos's point about inclusion, like, you know, the phrase nothing about us without us. But if you don't have openly disabled folks in your workspace or in your, your classroom setting, your school setting, you should probably ask yourself why. One, there are probably disabled folks, right, just given the numbers. But if, if there aren't, why aren't they? And if they are there, why aren't they comfortable disclosing their disability uh, in, in the office or in the school space, right? You need to be asking yourselves these questions about what environment you're creating. Like, again, Carlos talked about, you know, how accessibility isn't just physical. Like, what type of environment are you creating? Like, is the environment welcoming and accessible, right? Like, the example I like to use is, you know, if I'm in a space filled with people using misogynistic and sexist language, is that accessible? 
for a, a, a woman or a femme presenting individual or a non-binary individual, right? Like accessibility is so much more than just the physical spaces. Um, it, it, it really is the entire environment that includes the language that we're using. That includes, you know, um, I guess this is a physical thing, but like the fragrances, are you creating a fragrance free environment, right? Um, the, 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 the lighting, like it, it, accessibility is, is so, so, all encompassing. I think people miss that oftentimes. We think, oh, you know, the entrance is accessible, so we have an accessible space. Um, and, and, and that's not it at all. That, that's a great point, AJ. And, you know, one thing that in my experience, I've at least noticed open up and you start thinking about accessibility in, in your either your work site or your environment. You realize that the things that you make adjustments to or you change or you adjust for an individual with a disability a lot of times affects other people whether they have a disability or not and so it, a lot of times it will make life a whole lot simpler for everybody by just making one accommodation for for one individual and that's i don't know if everybody's had that kind of an experience but you know a lot of times you can find some correlation between what that person needs and what other people need whether they say that they have a disability or not and so you can make the whole environment better just by taking the time to open up and listen to individuals that have disabilities or the ones even without a disability, the people that are willing to talk about the problems that they, they do have and just being willing to make adjustments around that. Yeah, this is AJ. That's like, you know, cu curb cut theory, um, you know, making it easier for everyone. Um, accessible parking helps expectant mothers um, and other folks, right? Like, uh, I think that goes back to universal design. When you think about um, extra grip type things in the shower were made for, for folks who, who had um, muscular disabilities and had trouble handling things like easy grip things. I, I mean, um, the, the point really should be to make the world more accessible for everyone, right? Not just for disabled folks. And, you know, if you center disabled folks and kind of their experiences, um, you'll go a long way because again, ableism is, is built into everything, right? Um, so if we're tackling ableism and dismantling those structures, you're going to make the world more accessible just for everyone in general. And AJ, that kind of goes back to some of the models you spoke about earlier, where, you know, the medical model, um, you know, views disability as something that needs to be fixed and, and what have you. But, you know, we're living in a time now where it's, it's viewed more as the environment, you know, what, what in the environment is a barrier for a person with a disability. And when I say environment, again, it's not the physical environment itself, but all these other things like AJ described that are all inclusive when you talk about the environment and making it more accessible and more inclusive for somebody with a disability. Yeah, great. They, they, I mean, truly great, just great points, you know, Carlos and, and AJ there, both on that. You know, I wanted to just, I know we've got, what, about seven, eight minutes left here. I wanted to just open up and see if there's anything that you guys wanted to discuss that maybe we didn't touch on um, during this time. If you had some, some topics that uh, you wanted to make sure that we got on everybody's radar and they were aware. So I'll give you guys each uh, a minute or two to just kind of open up on other things that maybe we didn't discuss already. This is Angelica. Um... I wanna encourage people not to use the word handicap. Um, it comes and originates, it originates from um, hand in cap um, as if a person with a disability is a beggar. So one, that's one of the things I really would like to stress is don't use that word. Yeah, this is AJ. Um, something that, that I try to teach when I do trainings and go into places is talking about the privilege of being mediocre, being average. Um, and creating a space where folks can tend to do that, right? We're all on this call because we're advocates and we're okay speaking out, but not every disabled person wants to do that, right? Some disabled people just wanna navigate their life and, and, and just live, and that's okay, right? Um, I, I'm, I'm a black person, not every black person wants to be, you know, a civil rights advocate that's going up against the system. Some black people just want to exist in the world and we should create that privilege for people to kind of just be themselves and not have to, to speak out and, you know, be the disabled person that's that's demanding changes in accessibility right we should give people that freedom and that choice to say you know it's okay that i'm disabled but i don't want to to say that loudly and proudly i just want to go through my day um and, and that's a privilege that most disabled folks don't have most marginalized folks don't have um and we should be creating a world where they have that privilege to be you know mediocre if they so choose 
a great point, AJ. And the thing I just, I mean, we said it at the beginning, we said it throughout, but basically th this, this sounds perhaps complex and, 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 and what have you, but the basic principle is people with disabilities are people first. Uh, same goal, same desires, or maybe not, and they're okay. You know, if, if the person with this disability doesn't have a desire for a higher education or employment or whatever, they're just like a person, you know, without a disability. There's people with, without disabilities who aspire to, you know, growing and, and educating themselves and seeking out, you know, more, but there's people without disabilities who don't. So it's okay. Whatever the case may be, it's okay. But they're people first and they 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 have those um the right to to be a person in their own space. Yeah, and, and I think just to kind of piggyback on a little bit, Carlos, is, you know, I think we all have to understand and accept that too. I mean, that that's a big part of it is, you know, they, they may feel that way and they want to be able to express that. And we just need to be able to accept it on our end that it's okay. Not everybody has to be like us. And I know that sometimes that's hard because you, you think about how you want to go about things, how you want to do things, but not everybody's the same. And we, we've talked about that in so many different ways today. And it's just, you know, we need to each know that it's okay to let that person be who they are. Yeah, this is AJ. I think that's a great point. And, and just a small example of the complexity of disability and the identity and, you know, giving people freedom of choice. Not all deaf folks want cochlear implants, right? Some, some deaf folks are, are, vehemently against it right but and that's okay either choice is okay right if, if you wouldn't like a cochlear implant or if you would like to not have a cochlear implant both of those are okay but we should give folks the opportunity to choose the life that they want to live and, and make sure they're fully empowered to make that choice for themselves right not forcing them into one choice or the other but allowing them to be you know as carlos and angie have both kind of talked about their full human self and allow them to make that autonomous choice because disabled folks are capable of making choices for themselves And also, this Angelica, also this idea that a person with an intellectual disability um, shouldn't go to college, you know, um, piggybacking on what Carlos and AJ were saying is they're full humans, they could definitely aspire to more or decide not to, and that's still okay. All right, this is Jeff. So just, we got about two minutes here. So anything in closing that you guys would like to uh, say or, or address? I don't have anything else to add. It's been a pleasure to be a part of this panel today. And I, I hope that um, hope that something was said to, to um, get the, the, the wheels, the processes uh, going and, and thought processes, that's where it begins. And thinking about your systems that are in place and, and why and, and how things operate the way they do and are they inclusive. Um, but yeah, that's, that's all I have. I, I appreciate the opportunity to be here today. And Luz Angelica, I, I, I agree with Carlos. I'm, it's just an honor. Um, I'm very humbled just to be um, with this panel. And I just wanna thank obviously um, um, the panelists um, for just allowing me to share this space with you guys. Um, and uh, I, I hope that something that we said here today uh, helped somebody in the audience. And I will add in here too, um, if anybody had any questions and they wanted to, to put it in the Q&A piece, I mean, definitely take the time to do that. We'll try and answer those questions before we, we log off here. But I wanna make sure that that was out there for folks as well, if they had any questions. This is AJ, yeah, thanks Jeff. I was gonna say, I'm sorry no one asked a question, but if you have a question, um, please feel free to ask or email me. I just put my LinkedIn in the chat uh, for folks who want to reach out or have any questions or things like that. Um, but yeah. All right, I was looking, it doesn't look like anything's coming in uh, the, the Q&A piece. So we can give it just a minute here, see if anything does. Um, but I do, I, I want to make, take uh, just a minute while we can and just agree with all of you guys. I really appreciate being invited to be part of this panel and, and have this discussion with you guys. You know, even working in the disability field, you don't always think about some of these pieces. And so just to even hear your, your stories and your discussions and some of the things that, that you've dealt with, really just to keep my eyes open all the time. 
And so hopefully, you know, that will do stuff for the same thing for other folks that are that are listening here. It just makes you stop and think just a little bit about your actions and, and how you do things and what you see that otherwise you may have been, wouldn't have even addressed in the past. And thank you, Jeff, for moderating. You've done an excellent job. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Jeff. <laughs> thank you, Jeff. Thank you all so much for having us. Yes, thank you. All right, uh, Patricia, it looks like, so it's two o'clock now. It doesn't seem like there's any questions coming in. So I think we're all good. So thank you guys all for, for being part of the panel here. Yes, thank you, thank you, thank you. And then we'll send resources out um, in an email separately.